right, so our next speaker is Pierre Aron, who is a master's student in the Perrache lab at McGill. He will be presenting a simple model of an intriguing phenomenon about interneurons in the mouse uh, uh, head direction system. And this is yet another interneuron talk. So I love interneurons and I'm super excited. Please take it away, Pierre. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric Jones and uh, Alexandra for the previous talk. All right. The mice has an internal representation of its head direction. When its head points toward a particular direction, some neurons start to fire. When its head points toward another direction, other neurons start to fire. This representation is like a compass for the mice. And we can assess the tuning of each neuron with a tuning curve here on your left. The, head, the firing rate of each neuron is plotted uh, as a function of the head angle. We observe such tuning in the thalamus in the enterodorsal nuclei. This excitatory cells, which present this tuning, projects toward the cortex in the postubiculum. There, we still observe excitatory neurons with similar tunings. Oh. All right. But surprisingly, we observe that inhibitory cells of the fast packing types, inhibitory interneurons, present striking symmetry in their tuning curves. We observe one fold two-fold and even three-fold it stringer. It's as if it had extracted the harmonics of the input signal, as if the system was a prism here. Moreover, we observe that the distribution of each fold reflects the importance of the harmonics in reconstructing the input signal. So my task this year was to propose a computational model to, well, to simulate the emergence of these folds. And we found out that the randomly, random connectivity was perfectly explaining the phenomenon. Five packing cells are known to work in a linear regime, meaning we can write on the top their tuning curves as the sum of, a, of the weighted tuning curves of the inputs. The weights are positive or negative and pick randomly. Remarkably, as you can see in the bottom, we observe that the experimental tuning curve in black are well reproduced by the simulated one in green. We observe one-folded, two-folded, three-folded cells. Now in the remaining of the talk, I will prove that this is robust to the parameters of the random variable from which we sample the weights, to the sparsity of the connectivity, and also to the size of the number of neurons. Let's go into it. As of each of the points on your left is a network with a different combinations of mean and weight variants. In blue, it's when it's close to the observed experimental distribution. On your right, you can see that the blue area is very large, meaning that the distribution of fast packing tuning curves develops independently of the weights mean and variance over a large domain. Now an experiment of thoughts. If we take the impulse tuning curve and recenter them around the same preferred directions, the fold distribution completely disappears meaning that the fold's emergence relies on the input structure. Next, if we try to make the network a bit more um, like real neurons, say we force excitatory connections to be excitatory, and we force inhibitory connections to be inhibitory, and we add also sparsity to the connectivity, then we observe that the fold distribution still appear. If we change the size of the, num and of the, net of the layers, we increase the number of neurons as inputs and outputs, we observe that the faults are still learned. Well, so to conclude, the linear regime of fast packing interneurons, random connectivity, and inputs covering the ring led to symmetrical tuning curve. It was independent of the number of neurons and connection sparsity. We cannot make a prediction and generalize this statement. The linear prediction of a population covering a symmetrical manifold, we had a ring, it could be a torus, anything with a Symmetry forms M for these cells with regard to the symmetry. Thank you for your attention and to my amazing mentors, Adrien Perrache and Adrien Duskevich, which made the experiments. Now I think we can discuss a debate on this, and I've suggested uh, some options at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre. That was very like short and to the point, but covered so much stuff. Uh, right. I have lots of <laughs> And I'm looking forward to, so I will, I will ask questions until we get questions in the audience and then I will ask all of their questions. Um, I hope that there are many. Um, okay, so um, I had kind of a broad question about interneurons in tuning. 
um, which is uh, there's some parts of the field that will argue that um, interneurons do not show tuning, that, like mm -hmm. will not have, for instance, like very steep spatial tuning curves, for instance, in like entorhinal cortex um, or in hippocampus. And some papers that argue no, the interneurons must be critical for setting this tuning, even if the firing rates themselves don't seem to adopt these like tight tuning curves. So um, kind of given this perspective, what do you think the role is of, of these uh, fast spiking uh, interneurons in the head direction system in terms of changing the tuning of the excitatory cells? Oh, OK. So you're completely right. If we observe the tuning curves of the inhibitory neurons, it's only a modulation around the mean firing rate, which is about 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. But if you take excitatory cells around an inhibitory connection, we know they connect in a 200 microns uh, radius. And if you sum the tuning curves of these pyramidal cells, you see that they, um, they sum to the inhibitory tuning curves, meaning they are really influenced by these uh, inhibitory cells. It's like if, it's, if the tuning curves of the inhibitory cells was reflected on the local excitatory po population. So each excitatory cell is tuned toward a preferred angle, but taken as a subpopulation level, it reflects the symmetry of the inhibitory cells. Oh, and that fact, is a really neat. Sorry, keep yeah, going. Maybe, and also it could reflect a topographical organization, but we are not sure of that yet. Yeah, that is, uh, that is an excellent point that, um, I mean, you would expect something like that, right? If you're uh, expecting the interneurons to kind of act as hubs, that they mm -hmm. would have, that their, their like firing rate profile for whatever tuning curve they have might represent or be, be similar to, uh, the kind of sum of the uh, tuning curves of the excitatory cells that they're actually synapsing onto. Um, right, exactly, the, because not uh, an interneuron is not connected to the world population, it's only connected to a subset of it, mm -hmm. so yeah. All right, well, while we're waiting for uh, more audience questions, I wanted to take the bait on your link to grid cells. All right, okay. Uh, point, okay. yeah. Okay, let's go, okay, to the link to grid cells. So you've seen, one-folded, two-folded, and three-folded uh, tuning curves here. So, well, intuitively, we could say that the two-folded uh, cells could play a role in producing the boundary cells, whereas the three-folded could be playing a role in producing the grid cells. So this is an intuitive uh, point of view. Another point of view I would like to make is that we know the, the grid code is discretized, right? The, the, the scale of the grid cells varies um, not continuously, but in a discrete manner. So to me, uh, we could do as for the ring on the, on the torus of the grid cell, that is say there is a, a symmetries that, that are created in the grid code and that this is reflected in the, um, in the scales of the grid cells. But well, this is a bit uh, fuzzy, not very clear. We need to work on that. <laughs> okay. So would you like to challenge uh, these points? No, I, I like it. Well, in particular, so I, I've, my familiarity with the like square grids is that they're mostly from models where they don't have a non-negativity constraint, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh -huh. um, and that once you add that, then you get hexagonal grids. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I like I, I, now the models are pretty like consistently using that, I would uh, believe that. So. Um, so three, let's see, so you have two, three, and four fold cells. Um, are you then suggesting that that means that uh, cells that show these different tuning curves are more likely to, for instance, a two fold cell is going to be more likely to synapse onto a boundary cell and that you would find that like connectivity hardwired? Yeah, but uh, we think that the excitatory populations that reflect the inhibitory tuning curves this subpopulation will project uh, toward boundary cells, whereas another subpopulation with, which reflects threefold would, would project toward a, a grid cells, maybe. But mm. as you see on the bottom, is the problem is here we have one ring, we need another one to create a torus, right? So we need a, another variable. Right, right. Very interesting. Um, do you have any, and I'll ask, I'll ask one last quick question. Um, do you have any thoughts on, um, uh, so there's been some kind of recent work looking at how these interneurons encode speed. 
Um, mm. And we've been having some discussions lately about how um, uh, how a path integrator would work given different speed codes, either given speed codes organized by theta versus organized by individual cells. Um, so a speed code could be to advance basically things around a continuous attractor network could be conveyed by theta um, or by uh, speed coding individual neurons. Um, do you think that these fast biking basket cells could contribute to that signal? It's a little mm -hmm. tangential. Uh, I don't really know. Sorry, this one is a bit hard for me to answer. Um, but I would say it's, it's interesting to look at um, uh, the uh, speed code uh, in, in this uh, prospect of creating grid cells. I, mean, I think the two will, of course, uh, uh, play a, a role. But um, there is an important effect I've not talked about in the head direction pathway is that the, the head signal, the representation is a bit ahead of the real head signal, right? And this um, delay um, decreases as you go up in the, to lay, in the layers toward the possible kilo. So maybe it has also um, a role with um, how speed is integrated, but uh, it's a bit also unclear sorry <laughs> yeah no it's, it's a it's a difficult question we're gonna need a lot more experiments to and, and models to really kind of figure it out um all right well thank you so much pierre for that lovely talk and for answering all of my ridiculous questions uh, uh, we'll, I'll do a stop. Uh, uh, yeah all right. all right we will now go to our last speaker